uh, thank you very much. It's a great uh, honor to speak here today um, on the topic of drug-drug interactions in the era of novel therapies. And uh, I come from Portland, Oregon, um, so, which is different than New York City, um, and I think it will show through my talk. So, um, uh, today, um, if you could please advance the slides. I would like to start with a clinical case. So, uh, let's think of a 72-year-old woman who presented with uh, CLL in 2011. And that was detected during DCIS walkup, uh, basically by peripheral blood lymphocytosis. And that's how we typically find CLL. So there was a monoclonal population of CD519 positive B cells, which expressed CD38. Uh, FISH showed deletion 11Q23. And uh, in 2012, soon after diagnosis, she was treated with bendamustine rituximab for six cycles, followed by rituximab maintenance for what it's worth uh, uh, every three months uh, for two years. So uh, she ultimately progressed following that treatment and received Gaziva uh, for six cycles uh, with stable disease. And uh, um, because of the stable disease and um, ongoing fatigue and B symptoms, she was uh, treated with Ibrutinib. Um, at that point, the lymphadenopathy was bulky, about 12 centimeters, and repeat fish still showed deletion 11Q23. So unfortunately, uh, while lymphadenopathy was improving about two months later, she developed worsening neutropenia and severe spontaneous bruising. And um, therefore, Ibrutinib was stopped after two months for uh, potentially progressive disease and as, as well as uh, adverse events and patient was issued prescription for venetoclax with a follow-up in one month. So uh, the issue here is uh, uh, the adverse events which developed on Ibrutinib. Uh, and uh, this is a very common occurrence right now. If you look at, uh, if you look at the data which was presented by uh, Susan O'Brien at the most recent ASH, uh, um, uh, and the data which came from early, uh, fairly early clinical trials with Ibrutinib, it seems that about 20% uh, of patients who are treated with Ibrutinib discontinue because of adverse events. And that's uh, on clinical trials. And it seems that in both treatment-naive and relapsed refractory patient populations, the number is about the same. Uh, I would like to quote this slide by Anthony Mata, who will be speaking a bit later, uh, because it seems that in the real world, the rate of discontinuation of Ibrutinib is even higher and uh, approaches 40% and the majority of that will be for toxicity. And you know, the toxicities are diverse. The bleeding, uh, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, um, infections, etc., etc. So this is certainly not uh, what we expected when Ibrutinib was first appeared, had first went on the market. And uh, what is happening here, folks? How do we make Ibrutinib great again? So uh, it seems that one of the problems which uh, happens with Ibrutinib is drug-drug uh, interactions. And uh, we are dealing with a population of patients where drug-drug interactions are, unfortunately, is a major issue. As you know, the median age of onset of CLL or diagnosis of CLL is 70 to 72 years old. And if you look at this data, uh, which demonstrates that many patients who are older uh, take a lot of medications, it's not unexpected that we will run into some problems here. So among you, United States patients who are older than 65, about 40% take five or more medications, and 20% take more than 10 meds. And among 70-year-old patients, about 75% of them take drugs which have known drug-drug interactions with chemotherapy and about a third of those were actually major. So therefore, drug-drug interactions are accounted, are estimated to potentially account for about a third of all adverse events with oncology drugs. So let's look at the uh, uh, concurrent medications uh, with, in, in our patient. So this is what uh, the patient took together with uh, Ibrutinib. And um, uh, unfortunately, not all of them fit on this slide, uh, and I, I decided to not make the font any smaller. So overall, she took about 30 medications, and on some days, 35. So uh, how does drug-drug interaction work? So it's related to drug metabolism, and there are two major systems which are worth mentioning. 
One of them um, is SIP3A4 system, which of course uh, um, uh, all, all of us have heard about. And uh, that works both in the intestine and in the liver. And then there is pig like a protein, which is uh, responsible for uh, transplant of drugs, essentially, and that's mostly in the intestines. So if you look at the brutnip, it's, uh, it happens to be a CYP3A4 substrate. So it is metabolized by CYP3A4 in the liver. And if you look at those graphs um, where uh, uh, the black dots, say, on the left, is uh, ibrutinib alone, and the white dots is ibrutinib plus uh, ketoconazole, you would see that uh, the area on the curve, the exposure, so, so to speak, to ibrutinib uh, increases 20-fold when you administer it with a strong um, inhibitor of uh, CYP3A4. By contrast, if uh, you administer ibrutinib with a CYP3A4 inducer, like um, here on the right, um, if rifampin has been used, uh, exposure to ibrutinib actually goes down by about tenfold. So there is a very significant drug-drug interaction there, which may potentially account for some of the toxicities. And uh, those uh, CYP3A4 inhibitors and inducers are not a trivial thing. There are quite a few drugs out there which we use daily, particularly in uh, hematologic oncology. Like if you look, I, I, I bolden some of them up, pitraconazole, ketoconazole, posaconazole, and among moderate um, um, inhibitors of CYP3A4, Cipro, Diltiazem, et cetera, et cetera, verapamil, so some calcium channel blockers. So our patient presented with bleeding, and bleeding, of course, is one of the uh, feared complications of uh, Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors. It, it's been you know, reported uh, for sure in randomized trial that, trials that uh, the risk of bleeding does go up on abrutinib. And if uh, you look at some of the randomized trials uh, quoted here, the risk of bleeding, uh, at least um, low-grade bleeding, low -grade bleeding on abrutinib is uh, 30 to 40 percent, which is much higher than control. And uh, even major bleeds, such as intracranial bleeds, GI bleeds, that risk goes up as well. So um, it is a very interesting topic because as a BTK inhibitor, if you think of a Brutnip as a BTK inhibitor, you wouldn't necessarily expect this adverse event. And why is that? Because patients with uh, Bruton I gamma globulinemia, where BTK is abnormal, actually do not have the bleeding phenotype. And so some explanation, insight into this has been provided about 15 years ago by you know, several publications of which this is one, uh, where uh, the authors have shown that inhibiting BTK alone or knocking down BTK alone is not enough. To achieve a bleeding phenotype in mice, you need to uh, downregulate both BTK and uh, TEC kinase. And, uh, this actually fits pretty well with the ibrutinib kinase profile. So as we know now, ibrutinib inhibits both BTK and TEC, and as well as some other, some other kinases. So I actually happen to think of ibrutinib as a kinase inhibitor which also targets BTK. But nevertheless, this is um, uh, uh, a, a very good explanation for its adverse event on platelets. So what does it do? What does it do in a platelet? Um, ibrutinib certainly induces uh, a dysfunction of several pathways which are involved in platelet aggregation and adhesion. So basically any pathway in the platelet you can think of it will be affected. If you look at the slide uh, uh, which we put together with a fellow, uh, BTK and TEC are essentially everywhere there, except TEC is misspelled. Um, it's responsible for collagen-mediated adhesion and activation, uh, for interaction between von Willebrand uh, uh, factor and GP1B, uh, which is responsible for tethering at uh, high shear stress, so sort of the primary hemostasis response when the platelets go and pluck the holes. Uh, it, it's, it's responsible for CLEC2 ag mediated aggregation, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of these pathways are disrupted by this dual BTK tech inhibitor. Ibrutinib. And uh, this has been then uh, shown in vitro that ibrutinib will uh, impair, impair uh, 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 collagen mediated platelet aggregation, like on the left. And as well as in vivo, if you um, uh, take platelets from patients with ibrutinib, you can see that they, are, they do not aggregate as well 
uh, in response to certain stimuli as they would normally. And in fact, you can predict who would have bleeding and who would not have bleeding based on how those platelets re react uh, uh, to aggregation stimuli. So moreover, uh, Adrian Wiesner Group published this nice paper where you could actually predict who would do better or worse in terms of bleeding on a brutinib. And so what this shows is that there are certain uh, abnormalities which you can detect early on and stratify patients what their risk of bleeding on a brutinib will be. So increased baseline PFA by 100 epinephrine closure time actually predicted um, uh, risk of bleeding on a brutinib, as well as decreased baseline levels of uh, factor VIII and uh, uh, von Willebrand factor activity. So there is a very clear correlation between all these different factors and bleeding, and it really does relate nicely mechanistically to how a brutinib uh, works. So uh, it's been previously shown that blocking several of those pathways is associated with bleeding. And uh, this is one of the large meta-analyses, which included many, many trials uh, of dual antiplatelet uh, therapy with aspirin and drugs like the Plavix, clopidogrel. And so it's been shown before that combining aspirin and Plavix raises the risk of all and uh, major bleeding by 40 to 50 percent. And basically, this risk goes roughly from uh, 3 percent to 6 percent. So ibrutinib, which concurrently targets um, uh, those multiple pathways, essentially becomes sort of like a Plavix and aspirin combined. And therefore, it is not surprising that in some trials, this is specifically Steve Trion's trial, uh, uh, there is increased risk of uh, bleeding, particularly if you combine these drugs with um, this drug, ibrutinib, with uh, other antiplatelet agents. So there was this nice, presenta uh, nice presentation at ASH uh, last year from University of Virginia where uh, folks in Virginia looked at drug-drug uh, interactions and how it um, uh, affected bleeding phenotype on the brutinib. And basically, they found this interesting thing among uh, about uh, uh, close to 70, 80 patients they had. Basically, they found that all the major bleeding events uh, uh, which occurred on the brutinib happened on patients who took anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents or some CYP3A4 interacting drugs. Um, and also uh, patients who took anticoagulants, so platelet therapy, seven out of nine of them actually had a major bleed, like intracranial hemorrhage or GI. And uh, an important point to make is uh, to stop a brutinib around minor and major surgeries, because actually in this study, three major episodes in patients uh, who bled on a brutinib, uh, it happened uh, uh, in, uh, after the surgical procedures during the recovery period when the brutinib actually wasn't held. So it's, highly, it's very important to hold the brutinib for three to seven days depending on the extent of the procedures. So uh, um, what are the potential solutions to this problem? So certainly we have a lot of patients who are older and who need to take aspirin or Plavix or this or that. Um, so one thing to always look for is uh, potentially avoid use of NSAIDs, fish oils, vitamin E. So the problem with fish oils and vitamin E, which a lot of, at least my patients in Oregon take, is that it, uh, they do interfere with, with arachidonic acid cascade, and they do prevent formation of some of the pro-aggregant uh, prostacyclines. Um, so then uh, the rest of this uh, is sort of questionable, uh, but we put it out in a review that we recently wrote. We suggested, that, well, maybe it, it's worth stopping aspirin in patients on a brutinib who have low cardiovascular risk. I don't think we are there yet to use a brutinib uh, in patients with coronary artery disease. Once it costs as much as aspirin, maybe then, uh, but for now, uh, probably not. And for patients at high risk, uh, you could potentially combine a brutinib with uh, 81 milligrams of aspirin. So, and then they, we, we put out some recommendations for patients with cardiac stents and for patients who require anticoagulation. I think most of us have some experience with anticoagulation now, and uh, I've, I have certainly successfully combined the brutinib with direct oral anticoagulants, including rivaroxaban and apixaban, uh, without particularly, uh, uh, without too many problems. Um, I think one important thing to note is that uh, in a few patients, I actually did go to a half-dose apixaban uh, for therapy of DVT, and it has been shown before that after six months of therapy for DVT, this, is, uh, this actually can be done safely. 
So uh, let's look back at the concurrent medications for this patient. So actually, she did take a moderate CYP3A4 inhibitor, um, diltiazem. She took tamoxifen, which also moderately inhibits CYP3A4. And she did happen to take vitamin E, omega-3 fatty acids. In addition to that, in blue, she took a bunch of these um, uh, herbal medications, the effects of which were really unknown to me. And this is a very interesting point. So, um, you know, e even if you have, even if the doctor has an IQ that of a president, it's really hard to remember <laughs> what all those herbal supplements do. And, you know, it turns out that many of them are mild and moderate CYP3A4 inhibitors. And here are some examples. And uh, uh, there is a database, um, natural database, where all of this can be teased out, uh, particularly if the patient takes a lot of medications. The other problem is that many herbal supplements actually can cause throm thrombocytopenia by, itself, by themselves, and they, ca they can inhibit platelet function. And some of them are listed here as an example. Um, uh, so, and some of them can also increase Coumadin in fact, effects, although now we don't combine Abrutnik with Coumadin as much. And then we are also getting into this issue of immune modulation, and here is uh, an example of some herbal supplements which actually can be lymph activating in vitro, which can actually stimulate B cells and stimulate their growth. Uh, it's not known what they, they could potentially do in vivo, but it's, it's probably uh, prudent to uh, avoid them in B cell malignancies at least. So how do we use Abrutnip? And you know, I was struck by the simple message which I uh, saw at, uh, at, uh, at, at, at Tokyo airport, uh, which uh, basically the simplicity of it is very revealing. So it's better to maybe just use the Brutnip as is if we can, uh, and uh, eliminate some of those herbal supplements and such. It's not always possible, of course. Sometimes we do have to uh, uh, use some of those moderate CYP3A4 inhibitors. And Mayo Clinic did this nice work where they looked at an algorithm, uh, how you can potentially dose adjust the brutinib uh, based on uh, what uh, those patients also take. And they have shown that if you do that carefully and involve a pharmacist, you actually do not increase the risk of adverse events and the, or the risk of discontinuation of the drug. So now the package inset actually does have pretty uh, strict uh, guidelines what to do in terms of posaconazole specifically, voriconazole, as well as moderate uh, CYP3 and 4, CYP3A4 inhibitors. They do recommend taking it down to one pill. So one, uh, uh, one other issue we looked into is, uh, you know, it's sort of an indirect uh, look at uh, uh, what, what, what kind of uh, problems patients have, what, what kind of medications they take, is we looked at comorbidities and discontinuation of abrutinib, and we're going to be presenting this data in an oral session at ASH, so I would like to invite you all. It's still under embargo for another two days, but anyway, it's going to happen on Monday, I think. So what about some other drugs? Um, it turns out that this, all of these other novel agents, they do have the same problems. For example, venetoclax, the BH3 mimetic, which is a beautiful drug in CLL, um, it does interact uh, with both moderate and strong CYP3A4 inhibitors. So the recommendation there is to reduce venetoclax dose by 50-75%. There is also interaction with p glycoprotein inhibitors as well. This is the work we did together with Abvi on the PK studies of venetoclax. Uh, same thing with the delirisip. It seems to be a little uh, less of a concern there with CYP3A4 inhibitors. There, they don't seem to be of clinical relevance. However, what happens is that uh, a metabolite of the delirisip called GS563117 actually can inhibit CYP3A4. So therefore, if you co-administer the delirisip with CYP3A4 substrates, um, their level can, those drugs levels can potentially go up. So it's sort of a bit of a reverse um, relationship there. Finally, newly approved drug, Capanlisip, a dual PI3K alpha delta inhibitor. I haven't found any published information on it, uh, but uh, uh, the package inset recommends that uh, Capanlisip should be avoided uh, when it's concurrent, it should not really be used together with strong CYP3A4 inhibitors or inducers. So some of the emergent agent, emerging agents, the information is not quite there yet, but they still, both the calabrutinib and tirabrutinib, those second generation uh, BTK inhibitors, they also seem to have those interactions with CYP3A4. So um, 
overall, I, I would say that the careful assessment of drug-drug interactions is necessary, particularly in our population of patients with uh, CLL and mental cell lymphomas where ibrutinib is approved, uh, which tend to be older, have multiple comorbidities, and take many other drugs. Um, and uh, uh, in, with this particular patient, what we did is we actually stopped all of the herbal supplements. We stopped diltiazem, re re replaced it with something else, and she went back on the brutnip, and all of her adverse events have actually resolved, and uh, at this point she's in complete response about uh, 10 months later. So there is a way to mitigate some of those adverse events and reduce discontinuation, discontinuation rate for some of those novel agents. And uh, that's what I wanted to say today. Thank you very much.